Hello, welcome to Valley Talks. My name is Sylvia Gorajek and in today's episode I'm meeting with Amanda Bradford, founder and CEO of The League, an app for smart, ambitious and educated people. Amanda, it's such a pleasure to have you here on the show today. Thanks so much for having me. There's been a lot of controversy around The League in the media uh, because it's a very selective app. It's also a lot, a lot different than other dating apps. So I want to talk about this um, a bit later on. Uh, but first, let's talk about how the league works and who is it targeting, really? I like to say we're targeting people that don't want to settle. So mm -hmm. we really are geared towards people that you know have careers and that are really focused on building uh, an empire, if you will. But they, you know, they also want to prioritize dating. But it is definitely, you know, I call it busy, ambitious people that get very frustrated at a lot of the other dating apps and they don't have the time or desire really to swipe through a thousand profiles a day. So instead we give them you know, five curated matches a day, they can say yes or no, and then the next day we give them another five. So it's, it's kind of much more manageable for someone that is very busy and has a lot of things going on. So you select people based on what? So we look at a bunch of factors. So we're lucky enough to be able to integrate with both Facebook and LinkedIn. So we are able to see everything from what groups you've joined on LinkedIn to what mm -hmm. different titles you've had, which different companies you've worked for, who is in your network, how big your network is, um, everything from you know where, what industry you've worked in, what location you're from. And so we try to really create a balanced community that it's not all people that you know are math majors or it's not all people that are in PR. And so we really try to think of it as kind of like building a college, you know, a class, a university class or cohort of balanced people. So people have to have LinkedIn profile? We do require LinkedIn and Facebook at this time. Um, how many of those um, applications are you rejecting, actually, on average? So we don't look at it as rejecting, actually. We, you know, we kind of look at it as a prioritization funnel, uh -huh. and there's some people that move a little bit faster through the line, and I think that's for a couple different reasons. I mean, one is literally just supply-demand, so if you are in a, you know, if you are in kind of a high-demand age group, for, for whatever reason, you might move a lot faster. So we see this a lot with LGBT users, we don't have as many of them, so when they do sign up, they tend to get in very fast. And so um, it's, it's actually quite kind of complex if you think about it, because we're really trying to create this community that's balanced and it's maintained, and we're wanting to make sure that it doesn't get you know, too many girls or too many guys, mm -hmm. so we, we try to keep the ratios all in check. How easy or how hard it is to make those decisions? Well, we've, we've gotten it down to a science, really, where uh -huh. there's you know, a lot of the algorithm kind of shortlists people and prioritizes it based on some of the variables I mentioned. And then um, we do do a human review on all profile photos as well to make sure anyone is not using a fake profile or their photos are really low quality. Um, and we'll actually work with those people to say, like, hey, you know, your, your profile photos are not great because you weren't showing your face or you were wearing sunglasses and all of them. Um, so we'll really try to give feedback to people. So I look at it as like less of rejecting and more of like, hey, we're like kind of need to work with you a little bit, but it doesn't mean that they couldn't eventually get it. How many people are there at your team right now? Uh, we have 10. 10. And how many of them do work on the reviewing aspect? Yeah, well, those are, so we have 10 full-time and then another 10 part-time. So we have mm. about five people that are kind of helping with the review process. So the very strict curation is obviously your biggest strength. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine, that, you know, this is why um, all the buzz around your app happened and people started signing up because they trust you that the community is going to be high quality, right? Yeah, um, I hope so. Yeah, I think yeah. that's one of the reasons people like it. So it's also, it's very like limited, but also this drives the, the growth. Yeah, I think people are ready for like a smaller community mm -hmm. of more vetted people that are serious about dating. They're not looking for a one night stand. They're not looking to say lewd or inappropriate things. And we have a very strict um, enforcement policy. So if any person, whether it's a guy or girl, says anything that's offensive or hurtful or rude, we, we remove them from the community because we're not, you know, we don't need, um, we don't need a lot of users, we just need kind of the right users, so. I want to talk about like how you were growing it, launching it, that's very mm -hmm. interesting, and also about all the media buzz, as I mentioned, but maybe let's go uh, back to your um, early years and, and early career. You grew up in North Carolina? Yeah, I grew up actually in a couple places, uh, California, Texas, and North Carolina. 
and then I went to school in Pennsylvania. What brought you to uh, Silicon Valley? Uh, Salesforce.com, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they recruited me out of undergrad. I had never even heard of, you know, I hadn't heard, heard of uh, software as a service or CRM, and I was um, probably thinking I was going to go to New York, and then Salesforce came and um, convinced me to fly out and, like, check it out, and it was an amazing city. I fell in love with San Francisco. I fell in love with tech and kind of startups, and it was, yeah, I never, I never looked back. And then you, you switched to Google? Yeah, I switched to Google, um, wanted just a new experience and a new tech company. And How Google did you was, get to working at Google? Um, I had been, I think someone reached out to me because I was in a similar role, and mm -hmm. so they were hiring in their San Francisco office, which was exciting. Um, and yeah, then my manager was an amazing leader, and we clicked right away, and so we had a really great time together while we worked together. Did you always know that you would be running your own company soon? No, I mean, I was, I was pretty, um, you know, I was pretty happy in the tech companies I worked in. I really enjoyed my time at Salesforce. I really enjoyed my time at Google. Um, you know, I worked with amazing people. Everyone was really smart, motivated, disciplined. Um, I think, you know, I looked, a lot of the leaders had MBAs, so that made me start to think about going to get an MBA and trying to learn a little bit more about kind of the macro view of a business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, instead of just doing your kind of more siloed role, And so that's what got me into going into business school. And then I think at business school, you start to read a lot about different people starting a company. And that was when I thought I wanted to try it myself. Uh, so did you have to quit Google to do the MBA on Stanford? Yeah. What did you learn at Stanford that um, you think is most valuable for you right now? I would say that I think business school in general teaches you what you should be doing mm -hmm. and it doesn't necessarily mean you do it or you you know you do it correctly but you kind of have the awareness of knowing when you're not doing it that you should be so it's almost like this conscience where it's like I know I should be you know running these numbers and I know I should be you know focusing on hiring and even if you don't always kind of follow that playbook you sort of know you kind of know the playbook and I think that's a huge advantage. So do you feel like it's easier for you to run the league right now after the NBA? Um, I think I, I do. I think I, think I have a better, a better awareness mm -hmm. of the aspects of running a business and what are the things I need to do to be like a healthy um, business. Yeah. I, I don't necessarily, like I said, I don't necessarily think I'm doing them all right, but I, mm -hmm. I kind of know what, what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I don't think you can kind of learn good like marketing or good um, product design necessarily in school, but I think you're exposed to people who've done it really well and you kind of know how to recognize what, What's like what's needed to be done? Yeah. So I always say I don't think you necessarily walk away with like necessarily tactical or technical skills, but you walk away with kind of a broad understanding mm -hmm. of how to get how to get things done and what you need to do. And probably more courage. Yeah, I, I, I do. I think that's a great point. I think um, that's probably the second thing I would say is it you walk away with confidence, and that's honestly like 80% percent of I think success is just sort of having the guts to like go and and do it. And then the idea for the leak uh, came about while you were doing your MBA at Stanford. Yeah. Um, and it came out of the need that you found while you were using different dating apps and they didn't work. Right. Well, for you, right. yes. I was wondering if there really wasn't any other service that would be selecting the applications, that would be, you know, uh, trying to gather the community that, that is well educated or ambitious. There, not that I saw. I mean, mm -hmm. I looked around a lot. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to join as a user, so I wasn't even thinking about kind of building my own. Mm -hmm. And so I was just looking at, you know, in pure self-interest, and I didn't find anything that I felt was geared towards sort of like career-oriented females that wanted guys that, you know, liked that and were okay with that and wanted a really, you know, smart, ambitious woman. And so I thought that I would go, you know, I think Stanford Business School had a great environment of that and I wanted to kind of replicate that in in a digital community. So were you treating this idea seriously from the very beginning or were you like okay I'm going to build this and let's see what happens? It was definitely a let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah I mean it's a tough space, it's really competitive, there's a, you know I think over like 2,500 dating apps on the app store you know, chances of launching a successful consumer app are really small. So I, I kind of knew that going into it. And so I wanted to make sure I was 
I kind of put a time box around it. I said, I'm going to work on this for half a year, full time. Um, you know, I worked on it part time during school, but after I graduated, I said, let me give myself half a year. And if I can't get, you know, if people don't like it, if there's no traction, then I'll say, hey, it was a really fun experiment. So I think, and I think the takeaway there is like putting yourself on a timeline and trying to ship something really fast, even if it's kind of hacky, even if it's slow, even if it's not quite as beautiful as you want it to be. Um, mm -hmm. If you can at least just get some early feedback, that's super important because then you, you really know if it's a good use of, of your time or if you should be spending it on something else. When you had the idea that you want to build this, uh, what was the first step that you did? First step was actually I wrote out a like two page executive summary with you know the background, what the business model would be, what the competitive landscape looks like, who um, who else was in my space, what other people had tried and failed, and so just really getting kind of doing real research on everything that's happened, and then building out kind of a one or two pager that you could give to someone and say, here's my idea, what do you think about it? So I didn't do any you know you no wireframes, nothing. I just sort of like just talked about my idea in like a pretty clear way and then sent that to some, some, I actually didn't get accepted to any of them, but I sent it to like a bunch of these programs, accelerators, accelerators where that's like your first step is like submit an executive summary. And so um, I worked on that and then the next step was kind of creating wireframes around like what it would look like, how many screens would the app have. And then the next step was um, putting together, you know, an actual prototype. Mm -hmm. So figuring out what the, you know, like high fidelity, what the screens were really going to look like, what fonts, what colors, and then the logic, finding the developer, that was the big piece of it. Yes, I wanted to um, ask you who was coding it for you. Are you a coder yourself? So I, I, I did code in undergrad, but not mobile, and I had never learned mobile. And I took the iOS class at Stanford and dropped out on class five, I think, because <laughs> I realized that I got through you know, some of the exercises, but it, it became very glaringly obvious that the amount of time it would take me to get an app that I could ship was not going to be in that six month window that I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted mm -hmm. to to time box the experiment. And so I found, I first tried to do an outsourced development shop and that did not work. So I pulled the That's plug. That's expensive too, right? It was actually pretty cheap because they wanted, they had an interesting business model um, where you kind of pay a little up front and then you get more, you have to pay more later. Mm -hmm. So I tried that and I mean, I think there were some good and bad things of it. They made me really spec out the entire product. You, you really needed to think about every use case. So you, I kind of had to do all this like upfront work, which is, is good. And then once I realized they were not developing it well to my mm -hmm. expectations, I moved on to hiring someone full time here that could work with me and sit with me next, you know, next to me in a seat. And I paid him salary and equity and I kind of, you know, I kind of call him like a temporary co-founder at the time because we, you know, he was, we were there every day working together on it. And so we got to really know what the nuances of the product were and it was a really, I think a really good way to build an MVP. I was also wondering about, you know, how um, could you pay to this developer? Was it all your own funds that you collected? Um, yeah, we, I paid him $4,000 a month and I paid him equity and I just used my savings. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I had, um, I, I didn't have a lot of money. I took out a lot of loans for business school, but I took out loans so that I could have some liquidity to, to do something. So it ended up being, I think we worked together for six months. So then when I got the 25K, I could kind of use that to, to back pay a little bit. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, it's not, I mean, it was expensive, but it wasn't, you know, it's it's something that if you're really passionate about something, it's not a crazy amount. I mean, people pay $100,000 on cars, so it's like $4,000 to like start a project that might be your career, I think is is totally, you know, in doable. line. Yeah, yeah. doable. How about funding? Uh, when did you plan to start looking for inv uh, funding from investors? So our funding strategy is sort of interesting. I had actually been interviewing for a role at a, a VC fund and I decided to turn it down because I said, hey, I really want to work on this, ah, you know, so, this project. So it was during your The League um, project? So yeah, so it was during the second semester of my business school year and I wasn't sure if I was going to do The League full time and so I, mm. I turned it down and my investor Alex said, okay, well, I'd like to give you $25,000 to like go after your dreams which is like a really, you know, really amazing thing because he didn't know much about the product. He didn't know much about, um, 
what we were doing because it was so early, but he really believed in me because we had gone through you know rounds and rounds and rounds of interviews, so they got to know me really well. Can you talk more about this, how you were planning your launch uh, and the pre-party approach? Yeah. yeah, so we didn't have a lot of funding for like a really cool launch party. Um, I think I had raised maybe 50. I got the 25K check and then got another, another two 25K checks. We got 75, but I was paying my developer and... Um, I wasn't paying myself, but we were, you know, I really wanted to, to not spend a lot. So what we did was um, we looked for ways we could get people together because for dating, like that's what people want is they want to be around other single people. They want to meet people. People still prefer a, a lot in person things versus mm -hmm. online. And so we would just work with a lot of local bartenders and venue owners and try to cut deals with them and say like, look, if we do, will you give us half off? you know, drinks, if we pull in a hundred people here and we're going to have a little pre-mixer. And so we did a lot of like smaller events that weren't called a launch party, but they were just sort of a league preview party. And we made sure that people knew it was really just, you know, the focus was on the people, not on the like music or the food or the um, decorations. And so that... Or the performance. Yeah, exactly. And so now, um, so we, yeah, we really just wanted people that were there for just to meet people. And when it comes to funding, you didn't focus on that at that time? Or, or were you looking for money at the same time? So, I mean, the thing I always recommend is you should have someone that is, you know, developing the whole time. And then in parallel, I would start to talk to investors, um, you know, not asking for money necessarily, but asking for feedback and asking for them to see the app and just priming them on just what we're doing and when we're going to launch and what we're expecting and asking, hey, what are good numbers that we should aim for? Um, and so it's really just almost like building your Rolodex of, of people that invest in your space. And then once you launch and if you have good traction, those are the people that you can then start to kind of re-engage with and say, hey, we launched, we did really well, here's some cool things that people are saying about us. Um, would you, you know, we're now ready to, to start fundraising, are you interested? And so. Um, I think it's really important to kind of meet people when you're not asking them for something um, and then ask them for something once you sort of yeah. have some, some proof points. It's just a lot more work yeah. and yeah. time. Uh, but uh, you're saying it's worth it. It's, it's much better conversion when it comes to users and investors doing it this way? I think so. I think kind of giving a, people, like the longer you've been around, the more successful you're going to be, right? Just because by definition, people have like more time more word of mouth, more time in the market is always just better for building a brand. And so I think just like fundraising and getting users is, you know, about building a brand and people have heard of that company. And so I think doing starting as early as you can is great. And even if it takes you two years to get the market out, get to market, then you still have those two years where you're talking to people, you're meeting people, you're building up your Rolodex of both users and investors. And then you can kind of leverage that once you're ready to, to ask them for something. That's very interesting, and that's also a little different than many other founders, um, a different approach than many other founders are doing, I think. Um, because, you know, many people would think, I need to raise money first because right. before I do all those parties and launch, like, how can I do that without money? How did you know that this is going to be better? Well, I didn't really have a choice. I mean, dating, no one wants to fund dating. Um, I was a single mm -hmm. founder. I wasn't doing the development work myself. Um, the dating market is incredibly crowded. Mobile apps are really hard to even be in like the leaderboard on anything. And so I was really going up against a pretty tough situation. Um, the fact that I even got the 25K was like a huge windfall because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, it wasn't even really, be, it was mostly because I had done such a good job in my interviews and it wasn't even because of like the space or my, my prototype or anything like that. So it was um, kind of like the only way we could. I think we didn't have the benefit of being like, you know, a Stanford dream team of developers and designers that have this really cool, slick prototype and then go raise money based on hopes and dreams. So I kind of did the more pragmatic approach where I said, I'm going to build a product that I think people like. I'm going to get people to, to like it. And then I'm going to show that to investors and ask them for money once, you know, once we have users that can kind of testify for us. Are you raising money right now? We're not. We're actually focusing on building out our business model. So we've started adding in some monetization and we're really trying to tweak that to see um, what kind of, you know, how big do we need to be? Could we just launch in five cities? Do we need to launch in 100 cities? What is the kind of value of a user and, and really figuring that out? And then at that point, I think then we could raise funding once we know how many cities we want to be in and how easy 
It is to monetize. It is going to be monetized. Yeah, and we've we've seen. You know, we're trying some in-app purchases. We're trying the memberships. We're trying a couple things. So we want to do a couple more experiments this summer and then potentially next year. Yeah, I saw I saw a little bit of that. That actually already I could pay. Uh, a membership and then that would cause that I'm being reviewed faster. Right. So we're sort of one of our ideas is, you know, monetizing people's impatience, mm -hmm. which for me, that's like how everybody gets me on Uber or whatever. Yeah, I'm always like, I need to be, I'm late. I need to be there. I'll pay three X or whatever. So that's sort of the idea of if people don't want to wait three or four weeks and they really are just, you know, they really want to be in the league now. Then and now you're using all the interest to monetize. Yeah. And so I think I think it's like I think it's like an ethical way to monetize because it's, you know, they could wait four weeks. We're not forcing mm -hmm. anyone to do that. And it doesn't mean that they can't get in without pain. It's just, a, you know, it's just sort of you'll have better odds if you if you pay that fee and you'll be expedited and you'll get reviewed faster. At this point, I'm thinking that, you know, your selectiveness is obviously your biggest strength and that's the, the, the main feature of the app. But at the same time, I'm sure you, um, you're you thinking also about that. It works a little towards your disadvantage too, right? Because it just, uh, the community is smaller. Right. When it comes to monetization, it's harder, right? Because the statistically is less Well, right, chance, yeah, you have less uh, users, more users, more revenue, right? Yeah. So. Uh, did you ever consider that maybe you will need to rebuild this approach? I mean, I think my goal is to build a business model that we can stay kind of a small, close-knit community mm -hmm. in maybe 10 to 20 core cities that um, we don't need to be a tender. We don't need to be in every city in the world. Um, but I want to be a, kind of a really strong business model in the cities we're in and we know them and we can do really local events and we can get to know our, our users really well. So, um, yeah, so I don't think we'll ever, you know, we'll always have a wait list. We're never going to just like let everyone in. We'll always mm -hmm. want to keep that selectivity because I think that's what people are excited about is that they're, they are in a smaller community and they do feel closer to someone and they do trust you and they'll go out to coffee with you because they know that someone has made sure you're a real person you haven't had like complaints against you. You know, we, we do all this stuff to make people feel safer. And I think that's a really key thing I want to preserve. When it comes to press, um, it kind of happened on its own, right? The, the, all the press buzz and everything, or were you actually trying to reach out to them first? No, no, we didn't. We weren't ready yet. We were, I think, three months from launching. So I wasn't even thinking about press. Uh -huh. And I was actually still trying to get people to sign up so that we could even launch it. I needed more, you know, more guys and SF. So I was reaching out to a friend who went to Wharton and I said, hey, can you get like some of your Wharton friends on to sign up so we can launch and do like a really small beta. We were only going to do 100 guys and 100 girls or maybe it was 300 guys, 300 girls. But anyway, it was a smaller group and I needed more guys. And so he posted on his Facebook wall and I gave him some like marketing copy to, to write and be like, hey, this is the new <laughs> app. Um, here's the like premise. Um, I think I said, take the 30, top 30 percent of tender and you have the league mm -hmm. um, or something that was like very easy to identify. And then I guess there was a reporter that was somehow in the Facebook group. And so then she ran with it. And this was like three months before we were even ready to to like open the doors. So then she launched it. And so we got it kind of started a little bit of a whirlwind, which was pretty interesting. I <laughs> experience. mean, were you happy at the beginning? I mean, I think. I guess, yeah, you're, you're happy because it, I think it's hard. It is hard to get press. Like whenever mm -hmm. we wanted to get press, we don't get press. And whenever yeah. we don't really want to get press, we get press. So it's like a very difficult thing to control. So I think, yeah, I was happy that people had started to hear about it. We got that, the, you know, we, we ended up getting enough guys to sign up after that article came out, which was great. So we could launch our beta. Um, it wasn't exactly the messaging I wanted. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting learning for me to be like, oh, this is what this is what happens when kind of reporters just see something mm -hmm. and you have to be really kind of calculated and careful with your messaging or else they'll make it whatever they want it to be. And so I think that was like a good learning for me, not that we necessarily, you know, changed it for a while, but it was, um, yeah, it was just like a really interesting kind of first experience with press and media. Did you expect at all that it may happen like this at some point, that this may be, um, you know, an easy topic for media to catch and then maybe turn it into something um, that they would criticize. I did expect that we would get some criticism. I think the extent of it was, you know, I wasn't quite prepared mm -hmm. for how upset people would be. I thought it would just be like, oh, they're, you know, being selective or snooty 
or something like that, and yeah. it, it, it kind of turned on its head a little bit. But I'm thinking what's actually wrong in, even if you would admit or you would want it to be elite, what's wrong in that? Well, I think the word elite is, you know, it has different connotations to different people, mm -hmm. right? So you could think of it as very well educated, other people think of it as very rich, other people think of it as like a trust fund where you didn't really do much and you were given a lot of money mm -hmm. and now you're living off your parents' money. Mm -hmm. And so I think other people think gold digger because they think of a woman that is trying to meet a guy with a lot. So there's a lot of different kind of stereotypes people have with that word and I think that was part of the problem is mm -hmm. that it wasn't just like for the educated and ambitious, that I would have been fine with that messaging, right? But it was for yeah. the elites and then I think everyone has their own interpretation of that. Are you aware at all how many people are actually um, dating thanks to your app? We don't have a great feedback loop, but I know I know like anecdotally of 20 weddings happening hmm. from the league. And I know one couple. You do? Yeah. Yeah. And we, we do know, like now we're starting to collect it, so we're getting better data back. But um, yeah, I mean, it's been a lot. I have a ton of they, people that write in and we, we call it like a league timeout. So you take a league timeout when you've met someone you're excited about and you want to kind of put your account on pause and we get a ton of those. Which is, I think, a good thing because they, that means they want to come back, but they are really excited about this person. So that's sort of what I see as like a success metric. What would you say that is the biggest challenge um, while growing the league? Uh, for us, it's been hiring technical talent. I mean, it's, it's not a great, <laughs> it's an answer everybody says, but it's been really challenging because in Silicon Valley, um, the really talented engineers tend to want to build their own products and they don't necessarily value the fact that like they still have to get traction, funding, um, product market fit, find a marketing person. And so we'll, you know, it'll, it was really hard at the beginning to get those people kind of on our team. And then I think we've also tried junior people and then they, it's very competitive here. So you, you know, they, you, we, you give them an offer and then they turn around and get an offer for 2X from Uber or yeah. Google. So And actually during the interview, they can say, they can be pretty, I heard those, uh, I mean, I've been in those situations that they could say, well, what are you offering to me? I could work at Google and, like, right. but then like, why are you here? Right. So I think it's been, it's what, what we're trying to do now is really find people that believe in the mission and that are like, just stop using these kind of headhunter things where people are just trying to optimize for salary and really mm -hmm. find people that are optimizing to build something, to be part of a founding team. They want you know, equity in the company and I'd rather them negotiate for a bigger equity stake than a 20% higher salary. And that's sort of what I've been using to kind of now vet the engineering team. But before that I wasn't, I was just trying to play with mm -hmm. The, you know, we had just raised $2 million, so I was like, okay, well, yeah, we'll pay you the same salary as Google, and that didn't work well for us. And is there anything that you would do differently? On how I build the yeah. product? I probably would have looked a little bit harder for a co-founder. I think I was really, I'm a very impatient person. I move really fast. I really don't like inefficiency and... You know, I, I kind of like looked a little bit and then I was like, this is, you know, it's like dating. I was like, this is not going well. I went on five co-founder dates, didn't like anyone. So I was like, yeah. you know, I'm done I'm, with dating, yeah. right? So I'm just going to do it myself. So um, I'm impatient too. Uh, so I just started it. And I, I do think there's like a ton of advantages to doing that because you, you move and like so much of startups is just like moving the ball forward. And but I, I do think if I had taken like maybe a couple weeks, we because we've had a lot of a lot of our like delays and the reason we're only in three cities, the reason we just now got over to the new platform is because we didn't really have a strong technical team in place from the beginning. And mm -hmm. that definitely is expensive and it takes a lot of time. And so. it, did it slow your growth too? Yeah, I mean, we've never been a growth story, unfortunately. I mean, I, we, our waiting list is great. Well, I, I feel like everyone says that you have great demand. Well, we have great, I guess growth, I consider growth like growth within, you know, are you now in Chicago, now in DC, and like you're growing and you're in more and more in cities. I think of, when I think of growth, I think of like Uber being in one city mm -hmm. last year and now in, you know, 20,000 cities this year. So we've really, you know, we were only in three cities and... Um, you know, our numbers could be a lot higher right now. Like we could be, you know, after two years of being in existence, our numbers aren't great compared to like, you know, some of the apps that are in 30 or 50 cities. So um, I think that that hurt us a little bit, but I think it also caused us to really make sure the product was really, really well built and that we're really listening to our users. And I think we have a much better product fit because of that. We didn't scale too early, but, but yeah, it definitely slowed down 
you know, we could probably have another 50,000 daily active users if we hadn't had so many kind of technical challenges. Do you still consider having another co-founder at all? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I think if the right, I, I, and I always equate this to dating, but it's so similar. It's like if the right guy yeah. came along and, you know, we, it was a really good fit and we worked really well together, like for sure. And I, I say guy, but girl or whoever. Um, but it is like dating where I think you can't just like expect to find that person when you go out and when you're going to dinner, you can't be like upset when you didn't find someone out there. So I think you should kind of like live your life assuming you got to figure out everything out yourself and then if if it happens it's a bonus there is just so much work around uh you know your community bring, um, growing the business and uh, building the product i try to imagine what your day looks like <laughs> can you can you just tell me oh do you gosh. sleep at all no i don't sleep my friend my uh my team calls me a vampire um no, I mean, I do, I do wear a lot of hats. I think I'm learning one of my weaknesses is delegating and mm -hmm. like enabling other people to own things. So I'm working on that. I'm trying to... Um, Did you have any vacation for the last two years? <laughs> None. But, but yeah, I think I'm getting there. We're like slowly, I'm, I'm slowly hire, building a team of people I really trust. And I think that's really important is once you start trusting people to carry on your mission and your messaging um, I'm starting to let go a little bit which is is scary but fun mm -hmm. and yeah I think that um, I I think that we'll get there but that's probably been my my day is is a lot of like I do the QA and I'm talking to the developers about this bug and we're trying to figure out what it might be so we're like in the weeds like we're in the code and then you switch gears to writing a press release mm -hmm. and then you switch gears to working with a designer on what the website or the marketing materials should look like for when we launch Chicago. And then the other one is building a spec for a new feature that we need to have on the roadmap. And then the other time is working with hiring, trying to find mm -hmm. good engineers because we're using a lot of contractors. So we're trying to bring them on site. So it's a little bit of like playing a lot of roles. Do you have any executives in your team or are you the only executive? Um, I have a couple of people that I, I consider executives that are mm -hmm. like my right hand people. Um, so, but no, I don't really believe in like hiring people for titles just because they've Yes, I mean the roles because uh, yeah. switching between those, all those things you're saying is just extremely hard. Yeah. And no, I mean, I think, but I do think we're, we're small enough in the sense that it allows us to get a, a feel for like where the holes are, where the, where, you know, what, what I'm doing that I'm really not good at, what I am good at, and then I can start to hire to fill those pieces. But I think if you don't do the roles yourself, it's really hard to value someone and hire someone that, because you want to hire someone better than you, right? Mm -hmm. So if I don't know how to do it and where I, kind of where I stand on like a QA or, um, you know, product management or PR, then it's hard for me to, to hire someone that's going to be a rock mm -hmm. star in that zone so are you using the app yourself i am yeah i only do you have time one. for that at all <laughs> not really I always, i'm a pretty flaky do you have someone in your team that would be just okay just pick people that work for me i know no i i use it i use it because i want to everyone always asks so like do you have special powers i'm like if i gave myself special powers that would be kind of against the whole premise of i'm trying to build an app for people like me so if, I, mm -hmm. if it's not working for me and i have to use special powers it's not a good sign so I use it just like anyone else, but um, yeah, I haven't, I am a little flaky. I don't really go meet up that much in person, but, um, but yeah, I use it and I've met some great people. I dated someone for a year from it. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's what I use to date when I'm in the dating mode right now. I'm in the hiring and getting our company to be built <laughs> mode, but. <laughs> and what's the biggest goal for the league? Um, I can imagine like growing into more cities. Yeah. Is this your, your goal right now or something else? Yeah, I think my goal is I want to be an international brand. So I want to be in London. I want to be in Toronto. I want to be in Sydney. Um, I want to be a brand that's recognizable across the world that stands for quality, that stands for ambitious people that are looking for other, you know, that are valuing intelligence and not valuing you know, beauty and not valuing youth or you're kind of like moving society forward into uh, kind of a more intelligent way of partnering and companionship. Um, and I think, you know, I want to be kind of a leader in, in that field of, of matching people based on actual compatibility. 
Amanda, um, it's a great story, uh, very inspirational, oh, and um, it's been such a pleasure to have you here today on the show. Uh, so for everyone who would want to check out the league and kind of like uh, put themselves on the list, yeah. uh, they can easily find it on App yeah, Store. Just go to theleague.com, you can download it on App Store, and then yeah, tell them to send in a note to their concierge to say they watched it and maybe we can give them some special treatment. Okay, let's do yeah. that. Thank you so much. All right, good to meet you.